The following production is part of the We Be Geeks Podcast Collective. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. The dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Hello and happy October. Yes, we have begun October. And uh, October 1st brings with it a couple of uh, noteworthy bits for for those of us that still do love some vintage Disney and uh, you modern Disney fans if you're still here. <laughs> but uh, Walt Disney World is now 51 years old. The year of celebration of 50 years is is officially done, I guess. I'm sure they're still going to have some stuff though, who knows. But uh, right now, I guess the focus is over there at Epcot because we've now just hit the 40th anniversary also on October 1st for Epcot. So, yeah, there's some anniversary things going on there, but uh, we're not really going to talk about those because, you know, we're not a Disney show anymore. we got a lot of fun stuff, though, coming up today. We're going to speak with Marshall Younger, uh, a showrunner and one of the writers for the Adventures in Odyssey show, which if you're not familiar with, uh, I do recommend you check it out. Uh, you probably got... Uh, if there's not a radio station near you that's playing this program, and I mean, this program's been going on for nearly 35 years, you can probably find, though, at your local library, you can find some CDs or cassettes of some of the shows dating way, way back. Because, I mean, 35 years that this show has been running. And so here's one of the writers. We're going to have a couple of writers over the next couple weeks. Uh, we've got Marshall Younger, as I said today, and Phil Lawler will be joining us next week. And I'm actually working on, uh, we're going to have Jim Corcus come back here, most likely. Uh, we're working on uh, getting out the details. He was out there in Florida, and as you all know, Hurricane, Fl- Hurricane Ian has uh, done some serious devastation in Florida. So hopefully Jim is doing okay, and we'll be able to have him on in the upcoming weeks. He's got a brand new book that I'm excited about. Uh, we'll call it, it's, it's kind of almost our namesake. We'll just say that. So I, I got to get a copy of this book. Uh, so uh, we're just going to leave it at that. I'm really excited about it. It sounds really, really cool. I actually heard it from Margaret Carey was talking about it on Facebook. But anyways, before we get going, we have some of our usuals of what we do. And I'm going to talk about what I've been playing before I talk about what I've been watching. Because what I've been watching, it gives me a chance to do some television review. But uh, what I've been playing, you'll, uh, you'll recall, I think even last week I mentioned, there was a demo available for... Valkyrie Elysium, uh, which is a Squaresoft game. Uh, well, I guess there's what Square Enix now. I keep wanting to call them Squaresoft because that's what they were for the longest time that I was familiar with them. But yeah, I think they're like Square Enix now because they uh, they merged in some fashion with Enix, which I think Enix at the time, their biggest thing was uh, the Tomb Raider games, which I don't even know if they have the rights on those. <laughs> so it could be somebody else making those at this point. I don't know. I haven't played a Tomb Raider game in a long time, although I do own. Uh, where they've kind of rebooted her and redesigned her. Uh, I am intending to play it. I just haven't gotten around to it. And uh, right now, because it's getting into October, it's time for me to start playing some scary use games. And many of you might recall, when I, last October, when I was still working for the radio station and uh, I wasn't getting out there doing the Uber and Lyft driving and that kind of things because, you know, uh, with, with the COVID thing going on last year at about that time, I was like, yeah, this is just too much complicated. I, I just really wouldn't want to do it. So I came back here during the day uh, and I played scary games and we had a thing called Scare Play that was going on on the Neverland official gaming channel and I plan on doing something similar uh, I'm going to play some scary type stuff well I'm, I'm going to I plan to upload some things I'm playing them games but I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be live this year I don't because I don't know if I can keep up with that sort of a thing but I can play a game and I can put together videos and I can post them up there uh, right now I'm playing the director's cut of the original Resident Evil uh, through streaming uh, because of my PlayStation Plus and I'm going to put that up there. Uh, I plan on, you know, last year I played The Evil Within, so this year I'm going to play The Evil Within 2. Uh, and I, I think it's about all the scary stuff I've really got to, for this year. I might replay some stuff. Uh, I actually had pretty good, you know, I don't get a whole lot of views necessarily on the gaming channel, but it uh, did fairly well. I put up my first playthrough of Resident Evil Village that I played uh, a couple months ago, and I, uh, people uh, seem to have been enjoying that. So... Uh, that's up there for your enjoyment if you would like to go and look at that as well. 
Um, but yeah, I need to find some more scary things to play this year. I, I started playing that Amnesia, uh, was it The Dark Descent, I think, or something, uh, that Amnesia series. And I have, a, I think I've got, the, it was like a free giveaway, Subnautica, which I think is one of the ones where I think um, uh, James Kennison had told me about where you're kind of underwater and there's some scary stuff going on underwater. I think that's Subnautica. Uh, it might have been a slightly different, but I might, you know, look into that one. But anyways, I plan on playing some scary games and sharing them with you. Also, one of the things that you might be used to if you're a long-time listener to the show is that we normally have had, like, you know, some sort of specific Halloween-themed shows uh, or scary-type shows or whatever. Uh, I even had one year that I had a ridiculous story thing going on where we, where we had the Neverland podcast became the Evil Land podcast, and I was taken away to the Upside Down. <laughs> And uh, had guests coming on trying to uh, find a way to rescue me. So I don't even know if the guests even realized I had this weird story going on. I tried to explain it to them, but I think they got confused. So <laughs> well, if you go back a few years, uh, look for logos on your whatever your podcast player. And for I had the Evil Land thing. And come and check it out. And you actually have to listen to the last episode of September of that year to find out when it happened. Because we went to, we had our, our virtual <clears throat> Disney park that we had in Neverland and and we we you know we we played as Neverland being a real type of you know place in our own in our own hearts you know and so we had a version of the haunted mansion we went into and I got snatched away while in the haunted mansion and we had a ghost host that took over with uh, I did a few vocal tricks <laughs> so we had a ghost host uh, but yeah I had a lot of fun doing it I even got a, a t shirt you can buy this Evil Land podcast so if you're ever curious about that go check it out you know you might have some fun with it and we had a lot of guests in there and I tried to make a story out of October but. This year, though, nothing special in October. We're just going to be, well, other than the fact that I've got some pretty cool guests. Uh, but, yeah, nothing sp- particularly fun or spooky other than scare playing going on. But So that's the, the playing. But uh, I was talking about Valkyrie Elysium. The demo had come out um, about a week ago. I sat down to play because I was scared. It looked really cool. Uh, and I wanted to check it out. Square Enix uh, usually does make some pretty good games. So I sat down and played it. And uh, it's basically, it's an action game. I think it's, you know, they're trying to have some role-playing style elements, perhaps, in there. But it played more like an action game. And I wondered if it wasn't a bit similar to the, uh, well, I think that a lot of people call it the Soulsborne type of series. Or that style of game. With the really difficult kind of bosses. But I don't know if it was as difficult as one of those. But it was very much a, an action style game. Uh, and it's it's not that it's a bad game, but I, I did find myself kind of getting bored it felt repetitive although i mean there is a lot of neat variety of different things uh but i didn't feel like i understood half of what they were trying to tell me oh if you do this this will happen what you know i did kind of understand that uh certain enemies have like a little logo over in their uh over their heads and their meter their health bars or whatever and it'll have like maybe a lightning bolt or a flame or whatever and that's supposed to be telling you like a, a weakness they have and it's similar to final fantasy 7 remake where if you can you can st- kind of stun an enemy or whatever but you can get an enemy if you hit them enough with their weakness they'll kind of you know be stuck uh in a, in a stun phase and if you hit them with their weakness again you can kind of hold them in that state so you can get a lot of free hits in uh so i mean it's not a bad game i don't know that I'm, i would buy it myself but uh I, I would you know recommend you try the demo you might uh you might have a lot more fun with it uh, it felt like it should have been a side-scrolling beat-em-up <laughs> the way it played but they were trying to add a lot of extra elements in there but I get a little confusing with some of the extra things they're, they're trying to add into it. So, I don't know. I couldn't really get into it. So, like I said, I don't think I'm going to purchase it. And I've already deleted the demo because it, you know, that was about 20 gig. <laughs> so, I, I needed to make room for for the Evil Within 2. Uh, not to mention, I've ended up installing The Witcher 3 to play with that because there's monsters to kill in that game. So, if there's monsters to kill, October's the time to go and play games where you get to kill, kill monsters. That's That's what I think anyway. So anyways, that's what I was playing this week that I want to talk to you about and stuff that's coming up. Now, what have I been watching? And I believe Philip is watching this too. We didn't get a chance to get together to record anything. But Andor has premiered on Disney+, Plus, and I've now gotten to watch four episodes. I will say overall, it's a good show. It is a good show. It's a very slow-paced show. It's a very slow burn, and maybe slower than it should have been because, I mean, they released the first three episodes... And it took until the third episode for it to really pick up and start going. Until then, on the first episode, you're like, oh, he's looking for his sister or something? Okay, well, what's what's the story? And it's not till like, around third episode that things start to come together where you say, okay, here's the plot of this series, and here's how Cassie and Andor are slowly becoming part of the, the Rebels. 
you know, so, and it's still working its way that way slowly. It, it's like you get a moment to say, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go, because like, right now, like fourth episode, like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go hit this Imperial thing and rob them. And now it's a slow build up where we seem to have the same scene almost over and over with basically, uh, you know, because all the different characters that are on this planet, there's like, do we trust this guy? Because Cassian Endor, for some, some reason, has to use the alias Clem with the Rebels. Like, like the Rebels would care, but I guess that his name might be, he might be wanted because of some incidents in the first three episodes. But we have to go through each and every one of these characters that we're meeting and have them all doubt, like, who is this new guy? Why, we, it's too late to have a new guy. Yeah, we don't have time for this. They all basically said the same thing. The episode was like the same conversation four or five times. That's what I'm talking about being slow to build up. I mean, but it's, it's kind of holding my interest now. But uh, some people, oh, this is just the great best show of Star Wars ever. No, it doesn't feel like Star Wars at all. Star Wars should have some adventure and stuff going on. And right now, I just feel like, oh, it's it's like the anticipated. Well, something, believe me, something's going to happen in this show, which is kind of what we thought going into it. It's like, ooh, it's Cassian Andor. We remember him from Rogue One. He apparently had an interesting lifetime as a spy and maybe an assassin for the Rebellion. You know, because he talks about that. We thought, oh, well, we should see some interesting, some intrigue. And right now it's like, oh, it's coming. There's going to be some stuff. Just keep watching. We, prom, we promise we're going to get to it eventually. And that's what the show has felt like. It's like it's it's got promise. It's, it's going somewhere. And all these pathways of stuff is going to come together eventually. But right now it's not. It's, it's a slog to get through a little bit. Uh, and I appreciate they're building some story and trying to develop some character. I, I do appreciate that. But it doesn't. Uh, this is not what Star Wars should be like. You know, Star Wars should have some more adventure a little bit. And one thing that kind of bugged me, uh, we did have uh, our first incidents of foul language within Star Wars. Now, I mean, initially the first Star Wars movie, it was kind of aimed to where it was supposed to be, where kids were going to be able to watch. So kids do enjoy Star Wars. I mean, that is the way, you know, kids enjoy Star Wars. Uh, I didn't need some foul language put in there. Granted, I guess they're going to hear that language in a lot of other spots, especially for the parents who let their kids watch Deadpool movies. I'm not even going to get into that one. Uh, I, I think I've already talked about that on the 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 website a long time ago. Uh, of course, my news site kind of went cra got crashed. So I don't know if that article even exists anymore. But uh, we don't talk about it on the show. So, but yeah, I had an incident there uh, when I when I I, I was going to go check it out just to write up something, but I wasn't going to talk about it on the show. And I had something that I saw there that I was really disturbed by. Um, and so I'm not a fan of these Deadpool films, and I don't care if Wolverine's coming back in the third one. I'm not going. Sorry, uh, I get to be the unpopular opinion, but that's not the type of thing I go in for. So anyway, but yeah, I got sp spent too much time on that. What was I saying before that? Oh yeah, um, uh, the, the Star Wars the, should probably shouldn't have language like that in there. And I, I really didn't appreciate because now you know these kids are going to have to ask their parents, "What's a brothel?" Uh, and and parents, do you want to have to explain that to your kids? Because well, you know there might have been brothels somewhere in the Star Wars universe, but we didn't go into them, we didn't talk about them. But now it's become a front and center thing in the beginning of this series. So I uh, kind of don't appreciate that. But overall, I'd say it is a pretty good show, uh, and I am looking forward to see where this is all leading to. Uh, so I will continue to watch, and uh, if it leads to a fun and exciting Star Wars style adventure, I will be singing the praises of it finally getting there. <laughs> But it's taking a long time to get there. So the other thing we have this week. Mama, no. Yeah, I don't have a trailer for you this week. And I really only have one piece of news for you, but. Spanning the Disney and Geek Universe to bring you the best in comics, toys, movies, and entertainment. This is news from around Neverland. So the main thing is, you know, I wasn't going to worry about news because I got a pretty good size conversation with Marshall Younger to get to, and I don't want this show to run too long. But uh, he was showing me on Hasbro Pulse, and I saw some people kind of talking about this, getting excited about it. Hasbro Pulse is even about to have a big convention. But uh, Hasbro Pulse, you can get your face... You have to download their app, but you can get your face on, like, Marvel characters or Ghostbusters now. Uh, I don't know how much it's going to cost. We're kind of looking into this. Uh, we thought it would be fun to put my head on a Spider-Man body, uh, and I would love to be able to put a Peter Pan head on my head at the same time to be the official Spider-Pan figure. But I kind of want to be a Ghostbuster. That That's cool enough, but... Uh, they're also releasing some Raiders of the Lost Ark figures, and they've got some new figures, and they're going to retail you close to around, you know, like, $20. But you've got some uh, pretty pretty good posability 
on a uh, an Indy, a Marion, uh, Tote, or is that how you say your name? Well, Tote or whatever. But basically all the, the major players, the major four or five characters, are all going to have a figure. And they look amazing. They look really, really cool. So I'm pretty excited. I'm not sure when that's coming out. But I also saw, and you can pre-order these on Hasbro Pulse, by the way. They even have, and I, I don't know, I guess these might be figures that they had. Back when the movies came out, I don't recall seeing these figures, but they have a retro style figure, and that's a lot less expensive. But it's it's a basic style Indiana Jones figure you can get with just basically the shoulders and the uh, the hips basically being able to move. But I I kind of want to get it just because it's kind of cool retro little figure. But uh, these other Indiana Jones figures look really really neat, and I'm you know I keep telling Philip I'm trying to save it for a PS5, but I keep finding things to buy. And this is going on the list of something I might need to buy. I'm going to let him look into putting. He's probably going to get his face put on a. Uh, on a Ghostbuster or something. We were talking about how fun it would be to have your head put on a Masters in the Universe style character, and maybe if you got to choose... Hey, Mattel, are you paying attention? Uh, but if you got to choose your gear that went with your figure, like what you would have on the chest, because there's different kinds of chest pieces on Masters of the Universe, you know, that they all have, but it'd be fun to be able to choose that for your figure and choose uh, a couple of weapons for your and accessories or something for your figure to come with. To be put, you know, master. Of course, we're all never going to achieve that body. But to put my head on a Masters Universe body, and I might look good as a big old hunky, muscular dude, you know. <laughs> so that sounds like a fun idea. I just wish Mattel would which would do that. And who knows? Maybe it'll happen. Maybe they'll see what Hasbro is doing, and they'll say, you know what? Because <laughs> I I would get one. That would be really cool. Uh, I think there was. Oh yeah, the other thing that uh, on Hasbro Pulse that uh, uh, Philip was showing me is they've got some new. Uh, larger size G.I. Joe figures, and they're modeled to look like the classic G.I. Joe, but they're, these are about, uh, I'd say probably about a six-inch figure, if I remember correctly. I'm, I don't have the website up. I'm just going by memory here. <laughs> but they have some pretty good-sized G.I. Joe figures that are really cool boxes, and he showed me a picture of the Baroness figure, and it looks just like the old classic figure. just looks really, really cool. So some new G.I. Joe figures coming as well. But that's the only news I really wanted to share with you because I thought it was pretty cool. That's some great toy news. Uh, but I do have, at this point... A movie review. Oh, Want to see a movie? Yeah. Any good? It was bad. I'm fuzzy on the whole good bad thing. My eyeballs could have been sucked from their sockets. I like it a lot. The best movie ever made. A fandom a nexus, nexus, nexus movie nexus. review. Now I'm gonna be honest. I didn't finish watching this movie because I don't think I could take it. Hocus Pocus Two has arrived on Disney Plus. And I had to ask myself the question, okay, do we, did we need Hocus Pocus 2? Was there a good reason other than people do enjoy And I do love the original Hocus Pocus. It is a fun thing. I like to watch it every October. It's, it's goofy and fun. But it didn't lend itself to a sequel. You have Winifred's curse that says in 300 years, specifically on Halloween, you know, someone's going to light that, uh, that Black Flame Clandle and we'll, we'll be able to come back. But they were only supposed to be able to come back one night when they failed. Boom. And I'd say off to hell with the three witches, right? So why are they able to come back? They just kind of ignore the fact that she said it's going to be 300 years, and it seems like it's only happened once. We just need to have another black flame candle, and, and they'll just keep coming back, apparently. They just made that up. But no explanation to why, you know, your actresses have aged 30 years, and it's quite obvious they've aged 30 years. They look very, very different from how they did back with the original film, and they have not made an excuse for it. <laughs> so, like, okay. But uh, in a lot of ways, they just re respun the plot of the first movie, only doing slightly something more stupid, where the book has a spell uh, that'll make you like a super, the most powerful witch ever, but you're not supposed to read it. So the book is trying to deny you to read it. I'm like, well, then why is it even in the book? I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. And But it seems, of course, and this is something I've become more and more aware of, the, the I guess, wokeism, as what we, we will call it, uh, of a lot of film. Where if you're a white male, you either have to be played as a jerk or stupid because we have to make the women feel good. We have to push men down. And they're even as complaints like, yeah, which is supposed to get their 16-year-old. That sounds like something the patriarchy made up. Literally a line from the film. So that seems where we're, where we're going. And they, what, what was the final stupidity straw was there's one guy, and it was pretty obvious to me, he's trying to be friends with the, some of the main characters, but they blame him for taking their friend away, which there was, I think, some... Two of these girls kind of have, uh, well, let's just say some tension between them that I, I figured it was going to play out by the end. Uh, because they learned uh, with the 25th anniversary of the film, a Halloween special, that this is where I learned that this, f the original Hocus Pocus plays very well with the LGBTQ plus everybody community. Especially among drag queens, because drag queens think this, the, the costume of the Sanderson sisters are just perfect drag queens. 
So, of course, we had to have those moments in there where we had to, you know, make sure we showed a a gay couple. We had to make sure that we praised a, 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 a bearded guy who's dressed up as one of the Sanderson sisters. You know, we had to make sure we go in and say, oh, you look awesome. We had to make sure to throw those moments in there because we got to play to that audience. And that seems to be the only reason to make this movie is to play up to that audience and try to make money on of all of us who like the first one who were going to go. And I couldn't see even in the trailers any good reason to watch this, but I thought I would at least take a look so I could be fair with review on it. Uh, but the, the final straw was just Basically, you know, it was a words or violence kind of speech that they gave the, this one character, uh, I think Mike is his name. And he was trying, I could tell he was obviously trying to be friends, but they didn't like the words he chose for their basically doing witchcraft and rituals out in the woods for their birthday. And he, he refers to it as their witchery, but he didn't say it like it was a, he was treating it a bad thing. You know, it's not the words you use, it's the intention behind the words that's important, okay? I could use any word and put some nasty intention in the tone of my voice, and you would get a completely different meaning for it, okay? Intention and the tone of voice is what's important and he's obviously was being friendly but they you know they made a whole nasty thing but yeah it was just incredibly stupid it wasn't funny I didn't laugh at anything they tried to repeat some of the jokes they did before there's even one scene you know where they have at one point this one time in the movie really you see them do that walk where they kind of go left right left right and they're looking back and forth they tried to pull that off one time and say like, oh look they're doing that again okay uh, but then there was another time Bette Midler's not doing it but I see Sarah Jessica Parker is doing it and I, I couldn't tell if Kathy and Jimmy was doing it. I didn't get a chance to take it all in, but I was like, did they not coordinate? Oh, are we going to do it again for you know second time in this movie? Also, inexplicably, when the Sanderson sisters first pop up, like, oh, you know what was really cool in the first movie is when they all sang a song together? I know. Let's just have them sing a song as soon as they pop up, and we'll make it like that's a thing that they just like to sing. Really? That didn't get established. because In the first one, it's kind of hokey that they do it, but it kind of works because uh, like they're at the party, and they do a song, and it's I'm putting a spell on you because she's literally putting a spell on you. Uh, so and it, you kind of get over like, okay, this doesn't really make sense. How would she even know this, this song, uh, you know, and to be able to change it, you know, have different lyrics to it entirely, but you can't pull that same trick off twice in which they try to do at another party going on where they take the stage and they sing the song cause they need to put a spell on everybody. And they did it. I mean, you can't even think of what song that they did, uh, their parody of this time, but uh, they're just repeating the same things they did in the first movie and expecting us to fawn over ourselves or something. And the other thing I have to complain about is their child actresses that they have in uh, the beginning of the movie to have, like, the young Sanderson sisters when Winifred is turning 16. They're overacting so hard because they're trying so hard to mimic what the uh, the adult actresses did that it's very over the top, and it just looks terrible. It is awful. Somehow or another, Bette Midler can do some of those weird gestures she did and make it look believable. Bette Midler can pull this off. But the kid trying to be Winifred just looked ridiculous. This is a movie that tried extremely hard to get us to like it, but uh, unless you're like, we're diehard and we're super excited, I doubt you're going to enjoy this movie. If you are super, if you were super excited, you probably could go in there and say, well, that was good, because that's what I was seeing happen on Facebook. People who are like, oh, I can't wait, Hocus Pocus 2, and they're like, well, that was good. And I'm like, yeah, let's admit it. It's not a good movie. It's it's pretty bad. And it's as woke as you would expect if you were expecting that. And I'm going to call it out on that. Okay, but that's all I got to say for this. Now I'm going to turn it over to Marshall Younger, which uh, I kind of let, when I talked to him, I kind of let him induce, introduce himself. Next week with the Phil Lawler, uh, I'm going to have to put some introduction together because we kind of just got started talking. And Phil Lawler, you get him talking. He, uh, he's got a lot of things to say, and you're going to enjoy that next week. But I think you're also really going to enjoy Marshall Younger this week. So take it away, me, with Marshall Younger. <laughs> Okay, my Neverland and friends, we're going to have some fun here. We're going, for those of you that enjoy radio drama, and my gateway drug into radio drama was definitely Adventures in Odyssey, uh, produced by Focus <laughs> on the Family. But from there, after becoming a fan there, I, that'll that'll drive you into listening to Red Skelton. Uh, goodness sakes, so many different. I, and I always forget names of all these great old radio comedians uh, that I just love. And I've actually over here on the shelf, I've got... Uh, it's a collection of, uh, what was that one? It's suspense. Somebody got me like the suspense. That you, and even stuff like Bill Cosby used to joke about uh, the scary shows that he used to listen to as a child. But I love old radio dramas, and it's really because of Adventures and Odyssey. And so we're kind of beginning. We're going to talk to some of the writers who have worked on Adventure or currently work on Adventures and Odyssey. And uh, I believe, I think I saw that you're a showrunner currently, right? Yes. They, they uh, uh, a, year, a year and a half ago, um, I became the showrunner. It's a new, um, it's a new title 
they didn't use, they used to just call them producers. <laughs> so there have been like, 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 uh, uh, Paul McCusker has been a producer and Phil Lawler has been a producer. Uh, and or they were, and Dave Arnold has been a producer and, and they're, they're essentially showrunners, but this is the first time that ti- the title has been used. All right. But uh, anyways, go ahead and introduce yourself because we haven't gotten your name yet. Uh, my name is uh, Marshall Younger, and uh, like you said, I've, I've been the uh, I've been a showrunner for Avengers and Odyssey uh, for about a year and a half, and uh, I've been writing for the show since uh, 1992. That's a good long time. What is that? Th- oh, 30 years, I guess. I'm yeah, 30 say, years. My 30th year. Cool. Yeah, this is the longest running radio show I think of all time, isn't it? At this point. No, um, there are. Well, I mean, there is a, there's a show called Unshackled. Oh, and they're still making which it. Is, and there, I, I, you know what? I, I don't know. I think they're still. Uh, some, uh, I'm, I'm sure somebody, somebody in your audience knows. <laughs> somebody but might know. I, I don't. I don't know if they're still making it, but I know. I know theirs is like 50 years old. So I don't know that we're. Yeah, we're, we're, we're we still got still got a ways to go before we can catch them <laughs> if they have stuff. My but, goodness. Uh, yeah. So, so what got you started in writing? Did you was I hear a lot of people who end up writing books. They they're obsessed. They have to constantly be writing something, even as a as a youngster. Yeah. Was that your experience? I was, uh, I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was in the third grade. And that was because I had a teacher who, uh, you know, I would, I would write these stories and I would and just, just for, for fun. And, uh, and my teacher would read my stories to the class, you know, in, in lieu of, of a real author, you know, um, uh, instead of Dr. Seuss, she would read my stuff. Mm. And, uh, and it was, it was, that was so encouraging to me. But the thing that encouraged me more is that, you know, I would write these funny stories. I, uh, I wrote the, uh, the Vinnie the Pooh series, uh, which was a, a kind of a, a, a combination of Winnie the Pooh and Happy Days with the Fonzie, with Fonzie, yeah, with the Fonz. <laughs> so Vinnie, Vinnie, Vinnie the Pooh was like like Fonzie. Uh, I love that show, and so I I I, um, I stole that. But um, so I, I'd write these these stories that are supposed to be funny, and the class would would laugh, and that was it. I think <laughs> this is the best thing ever. I am gonna I want to do this for the rest of my life. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so I, I, I just, I just kept writing and I was writing stories, stories, stories. When my friends and I, and in, in junior high and high school, we would, um, we'd make movies. I'd write a script and we'd make movies and these, these ridiculous things that we would do. Uh, and it carried over into college. I did all, all through college and was a script and screenwriting major and, uh, in grad school and, and then, uh, got this job at, with Odyssey. So was your original intent, you wanted to, to write like for television initially or write movies when you're doing scripts? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to. I wanted to do movies. I did, and, or or television. Um, and I don't know. When I was in grad school, um, I didn't know had ever heard a radio drama. I I didn't know any. I didn't know anything about radio drama. I'd never heard one before in my life. And uh, and I was at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I was at grad school, and and there was a a poster up on the wall. Uh, and and the thing about Regent was the greatest thing is that. They had uh, four times as many directors as there were writers. Everybody wanted to direct, and nobody wanted, and very few wanted to write. <laughs> and so there would, there would be there would be signs up all over the place saying, "Hey, we're, we want to do this, uh, we direct this uh, television show, uh, this episode, or whatever. We need scripts, uh, or who wants? Uh, we're doing this this uh, uh, one act play. We need scripts." And there was there was a poster that said, uh, uh, "Okay, we're doing a radio drama, um, and we need scripts." And like I said, I'd never even heard a radio drama, much less <laughs> written one. So, uh, so I wrote, I, so I wrote this thing, not knowing what in the world I was doing. Um, and, uh, and they, they ended up, uh, you know, act, they, they got actors together and they produced it and all that. And the producer of the show, um, sent the final, uh, final version to focus on the family. Uh, and it went to broadcasting, I think, because, they, because they were trying to get a job for themselves. Um, uh, you know, as a producer or whatever, production engineer. And he sent it to focus on the family and uh, went to broadcasting. And then it went to Chuck Bolte, who was the old, it was the executive producer of Odyssey at that time. And he, he, and he handed it over to uh, Paul, Paul McCusker and Paul listened to it and, and had the, uh, the, the very interesting task then of calling this guy, this producer of the show and saying, yeah, we're not interested in you, but who wrote the script? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I, I don't know how that I, I know how that conversation went, but um, the, the guy the, the guy that produced the show and I we're, we're still friends on Facebook and 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 uh, uh, I 
very much appreciate that he's that he sent that along. I had no idea. You know, I didn't know that I didn't know anything about Odyssey. Uh, I knew very little about Focus on the Family. I knew I knew Dr. Dobson and such. But um, but then uh, Paul McCusker called me and said, Hey, do you want to uh, do you want to write some scripts? And uh, I wrote a bunch of freelance scripts, and then they hired me. What do you, would you say is your specialty uh, for the type of stories you like to tell? Is it mainly those those funny stories, or uh, or what would you say? Yeah, it would be? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I always lean toward comedy and um, uh, uh, you know, really slice of life stuff, mm-hmm. uh, things that, that kids really, really, really go through, and uh, that, that's that's my that's my bread and butter. And I've tried other things. I've tried mysteries, and I've I've, I've done some action adventure. I wrote a lot of the Nova, Nova Com series. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, and so I and I I enjoy that. I I enjoy all types of writing, but I but I really I always feel like my my best is kind of the simple stories, uh, and then the comedies. Yeah, and occasionally making me cry because I if I'm remembering correctly, you were because uh, I remember there was a special feature. I just actually finished listening up through album set seventy two, and there was a okay. really really good one, and I believe it was you because uh, they had a. Uh, you know, there's a special thing where they were talking to where the inspiration came for this story that was like a real life event. But they had a character Dion who had been kind of a, a, a budgling, maybe a bit of a bully, but he disappeared for like four months for a heart condition, came back. And a couple of the kids found out like, oh, hey, there was this kid that drowned. And we think the heart that you got came from him. And uh, this really great story that uh, by the end, I, I'm sitting there at work. I'm 45 years old sitting there in my office. Thankfully, it's my own office. Where uh, Dion meets the mother of the of the the son that were the son died to give him a heart, which of course yeah. had a great meaning. But uh, when when Dion pops out with a stethoscope, so you want to hear the heart beating? I I, I was gone. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah that was yeah, that, that that show was called Have a Heart, and it was mm-hmm. it was it was uh, based on a true story. My wife uh, um, is a nurse. And so she she brings home a lot of hospital stories, and and it was it was something that was that was very similar to that, um, and and interesting story that goes along with that. Um, so there there was a a a girl, I think she's maybe like thirteen years old, who who listened to that episode, and got uh, very interested in in organ donation, and and she was a she was a, a speaker. She uh, entered speech competitions at her school, and she spoke on it. Um, and then her, I think it was her friend's mother, because of that, ended up donating a kidney to a stranger wow. and it saved it and it saved his life. So, uh, and we're, we're, we're going to, um, I'm, I'm actually going to meet the, 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 the daughter and the mother, um, in October or something like that. They're coming, they're coming to Colorado Springs, mm. uh, and we're, and they're going to film this little, little, uh, featurette on that. Um, uh, but that, that's, I mean, you hear th- things like that and you go, I, I, that, that never, never once occurred to me that that, that could possibly happen. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's so humbling and it's so, and I'm so grateful that the God, the God that he made something like that happen. Yeah. See the adventure is not a show really. I mean, it's, it's very inspiring and yeah, I guess overall they're trying to aim at kids, you know, all over there, but, uh, Really, it's something the entire family, because I didn't discover Odyssey until I was probably in my mid to late teens uh, through watching oh, really? some of the videos yeah. of the cartoons we were showing the kids at my uh-huh. church. Uh, and so I was like, well, that's really neat. And I recognized some of the voices, like Katie Lee's voice. I'm like, why do I know her yeah, voice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I just found it on the radio. I was like, oh, this is what this is. And so I started listening. And then I started finding out the library had copies of it. So I started just listening all the time. And But uh, yeah, it's it's something that's, you know, you're it's targeting at kids. But yet the whole family can enjoy and get something out of. Uh, and even uh, these last few years, uh, really, you've tackled some really difficult topics uh, as, as a group and as a whole. Yeah. And it does seem like uh, between you and Phil Lawler and Kathy Buchanan, you do have those specialties. Phil Lawler is really good at writing those mysteries and presenting yeah. some of those more difficult topics. Kathy Buchanan, yeah, glad, that glad, family glad dynamic. That. Yeah. So yeah, yeah well, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad Phil takes those on because I, like I said, I'm not that great at writing them. So he so he fills that niche, <laughs> you know. And 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 Kathy too. I mean, I don't know if you've heard this mo- most recent uh, uh, album, seventy three. Not yet. Um, <laughs> but, oh, okay, all right. Well, you're in you're in for a treat uh, mm-hmm. because uh, it, that was it was it's a very it's a thriller, mystery, action adventure, um, and uh, and she she nailed it. I, I, I it's a fantastic um, series. 
He was showing all six episodes in that album. So awesome! I'm looking forward. I don't think it started airing yet. At least not around here. Uh, we I've got like no, one been, station I found. Yeah, in this, yeah, in the, I need club, to join the club one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> oh I, yeah, yeah. There's one Facebook group. I'm a member of a group that's that's called Odyssey Spoilers, and I should have been paying attention. Oh, wait yeah. a minute, because uh, they were talking about some stuff, and I was like, Alpha Seventy Three. It's like, wait a minute. That's not that's not even aired yet. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna hop out of this group. I was like, I'm, I don't want to know yet because I'm still catching up. So yeah, don't go don't go to that don't go, don't to, that go to that group because they're <laughs> they've even showed where I guess uh, some artwork has been released of what the cover for album seventy four is gonna look like. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that comes out in December. We're trying to get ahead of a lot of this stuff because you because you guys the fans have these mysterious ways of getting information <laughs> before we even put it out there. Um, I don't know how, how that happens, but somehow, hey, how did that, how did they post, they're posting like the, the album cover and all this stuff. We haven't published that yet. Yeah. But I, I don't, I know how it happens, but we're trying to get ahead of stuff a little bit better. Yeah. So I've, we're, we're, uh, I've had to retrain myself to not go after those, those insider bits. Uh, Cause I've, you know, been at this podcast for like, I'm in my ninth season of this and with all the entertainment news things that mainly I used to cover a lot of Disney. Uh, and there's so many different ways you could actually kind of get some of that information. And I was like, you know, I feel like I'm spoiling it a little bit for myself. And it's like, I didn't really want to know this until I saw this and whatever. And so I don't really want to tell people. So I completely understand. I don't know how people manage to get this information, but I'm always like, you know, I'd like to be surprised <laughs> when I when I hear it. I, I, I would. I wish everyone felt the same way you did, but uh, it gets out there. It gets out there somehow. I think it's just kind of what we're used to. Cause you know, at my age, I'm used to, you know, when you're a kid, when you're watching cartoons or all your favorite shows, unless you're going and subscribing to star log magazine or something, you're not getting a lot of that insider stuff. So you get to be surprised when new episodes of star Trek are on or whatever, you know, everything I yeah. watched, I had to wait for the next week. So I never knew what was happening, but uh, you know, I mean, the generation's coming after me now. They're so used to the internet that you can get everything as quick as possible. You can see the trailer for a movie online before you ever get to a movie theater and see it on a bigger screen. So I think it's just a well, different mindset. Yeah, so, something something that was really really was upsetting happened with um, with album seventy three, which was which is the one that the, the Kathy six parter that's the action adventure thing is is that um, somebody in our somebody in our office, the marketing department wrote wrote a uh, a summary of of the album, mm. um, and and it was not I, I didn't even get to get a chance to read read it. You know, all that stuff's supposed to go through me, uh, or or either me me or Nathan Hubler, and. Um, and it went to T- to Tyndale, who's the, the the people who published who put the albums out. Went to Tyndale like way before they should have sent it out. Mm. And there was all this information that was leaked, and and I don't know how they I don't know how these people uh, you know the fans found it. Oh, there was no. all this information that was leaked, and I was like, oh man, that's so disappointing because I just I wanted them to be surprised. But yeah, especially if it's got a good mystery to it, then you know, like you definitely don't want to have a clue of what's going on until you finally exactly. get to that yeah. solution. Yeah. So what is some of the difficulties when, uh, I mean, I, I think even here recently, uh, the, the actor who played Matthew Parker, I figured he must've aged out because he just kind of said, well, I'm not going to solve mysteries anymore with you, Emily. I'm just going to be gone. And he just disappeared. But how, how difficult is it when, when you're writing characters and you got ideas that you want to do with the character and you realize, well, the actor's voice is dropping or suddenly when one of these characters, you know, that's so iconic with the actor who plays it when they pass away. Like recently we've lost Will Ryan, but uh, considering like yeah. Walker Edmondson and I mean, heck, you're on your third wit by now. You know, what, how, how do you yeah. uh, kind of deal with that? Is there ever been like an idea that you had to drop because you lost the character you want to focus on when like the actor aged out it, or passed away? And it, it is a constant struggle. Um, uh, with, with, with kids, especially with boys, um, we, we you just can't hold on to boys, boys that long because, you know, you've got this character that you want to be frozen in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't, don't really want them to become teenagers because they, because then they, they don't relate to our core audience as much. You know, we, we've done that with some characters like Jimmy Barkley. We, we, we let him kind of age out. Um, but, but the, 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 the boys, you know, it's, 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 it's just hard to, 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 um, um, to prepare for them, them, their, their voices changing. It's not so bad with the girls. 
and and um because uh, it, it just it's just not as dramatic the voice changes isn't mm-hmm. as dramatic and we have we have now we we found a lot of adults now who play kids um and it's it's all i think all the adults that play kids all play girls um because we we've, we've had a hard time finding um any anyone who can play a, a realistic little boy um, we can, we, you know, if, if they're 12, 13, 14, then we can get away with it. But if, but, uh, a, an adult that can play an a eight, nine year old boy, is really, really hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and our, and our, our engineers are really strict about that stuff. They said, nah, he doesn't sound like, he doesn't sound enough like a, like a little kid. He sounds like an adult acting like a kid, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and you, you can get away with it with animation a lot more than you can, can with audio drama because yeah. like, like, like something in the, like the Simpsons, the same person has played Bart Simpson for 30 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, because, and I think it's possible because they have the visual representation there to, to back it up, yeah. you know, to back up who, who this person is, whereas an audio drama, you don't. Um, so, and, and as, as, as far as, as people, um, uh, uh, dying, man, uh, it's just, it's been, we, we have had such a tragic past. Just, uh, you know, but you get on the air for 35 years, it's going to happen. You know, you're yeah. going to lose, lose some people. We have lost some great people. I was just, yeah. I was just listening to, uh, I was just listening to a show the other day, uh, a show called Stubborn Streaks, um, and it had, and it had um, um, Bart, Bernard, Jack, and and Eugene in it. Mm. Like, oh man, all four of those guys are gone. Yeah, <laughs> it was just, oh, it's so so upsetting. Um, but uh, but yeah, we we just had to had had to roll with it, and so, it, we we handled it in different ways. Obviously, you said we have we're in our third wit. Um, with with Will Ryan, it was it was such a it's such a shock. We actually had, you know, he he died in November of last year. We had uh, I had written a show for Eugene uh, for for the October session that he was not able to do because he was too sick, um, and so and so I had to I had to completely rewrite that show to. So that it didn't have Eugene in it, and um, which we're which we're actually recording next month, um, and so and so it's I mean it's, you, ne- you never really really get used to it, but it, but Will Will's passing is going to be a bigger deal, yeah, because he was because um, you know I'm I'm not gonna, I'm not going to give away what we're uh, what we're uh, going to what the plans are what we're going to do with it, but you know he was such a unique actor. And he had such a unique perspective on Eugene, um, and, and he brought so much of himself to the character, you know. Um, and and uh, and and the other the other issue is is that he had so many friends, just uh, as part in, in, on the in the cast, and 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 we were great friends with him too. And and it's just the the emotional element mm-hmm. as well, you know. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, these people, you know, because uh, uh, you know Katie Lee, um, who plays Connie was really good friends with Will and, and she's had a, she's had a, a hard time, you know, just dealing yeah. with the loss. We, we all have. Uh, and so, you know, anything that we do with the character now is, is going to be an, an emotional, you know, roller coaster. Yeah. And that's part of the fun though, about the cast though, of adventures and honestly, you've had some seriously legendary voices in there. Yeah. Uh, through years, even some of your current people, when you go and look at like Townsend Coleman, uh, which I've I've gotten to speak yep. with him, and you know the original Michelangelo oh. of Ninja Turtles being the Tick, yep. so many different great yep. roles. Katie Lee's so many different great roles, uh, and even um, Jess. Uh, well, my brain, just, Harnell, yep. my brain went out the window. When you go yep. look at his resume of being on Animaniacs, uh, it's the, unending on, on unending. IMDb. You just scroll, 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 scroll. It's just unending. Yeah, he's been on everything. He's extremely busy now. I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to get him in the studio because he's just got stuff back to back. Uh, yeah. Very, very high in demand. But he's, he still loves doing Wooten. Um, uh, he, and he said he says that it's one of his favorite favorite characters to do. And, and so I, you know, I, we, we he'll do it for us. Um, but man, he's just <laughs> all working all the time. Oh yeah, especially with the with Rock Sugar. See that guy is just an uber yep. talent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, but I, I know at least with me, I would probably just be geeking out sitting there in the studio, like, oh, all these people, you know. So, th- is there a moment where when you have these new actors in and you go and you look up oh, all these people, like, oh, they're going to be reading one of my scripts? Is there a moment you have to kind of work that out of your system when you first meet some of these actors when you're like, oh, I know your your previous work. Yeah, What's that it, like? it, 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 I never, I, n- I never get beyond the, the, the awe that I have of, of these people that are, 
oh, they're saying my words. You know, like, it's just, <laughs> I, I've, I've never gotten past that, you know. Uh, and there, there have been times when I've been in the control room and looking into the studio and go, I cannot believe the talent that we have behind that glass. You know, and they're, and they're, uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's such a privilege and an honor um, to work with them. Um, and, and so many of them are believers, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and they, uh, and it's, 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 it's just a beautiful, beautiful relationship to have with uh, pe- people that, that believe in the, in the, uh, the messages that we have, uh, believe in our ministry. And um, uh, it, 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 we're, we're a family. We really are. And now the tough question, because you do have such a, a message that, that every episode's always got something that you can, can right. learn from it and something you can kind of take away and think about. And we see a lot in, uh, in, the, in the writing in, within Hollywood right now, and it's something that people like me, we complain about. It's like, wow, they have such an agenda in this, and we feel like movies are trying to preach at us. And it was a you know, really bad offense even uh, – with the Captain America and the uh, 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 as we got, um, I forgot the actor's name now, but we've got our new Captain America, and they're like the first thing they have him do when they get him in a good Captain America suit is he's basically preaching at all these different people and preaching it at the audience, and it turns us yeah. off. But yet Odyssey yeah. has gone on for this long and never felt preachy at all, but yet we always get something we can take. And we can think about and and be inspired and even get a little voice, a little verse from Chris by the end. And it's never felt preachy. So how do you do that? How do you manage to teach a good lesson without beating somebody over the head with it? I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you saying that. I think we've broken that rule on occasion um, because we, we, we do have a tendency. We've got this this man of wisdom and wit, uh, this character, and and uh, and and sometimes we will will use him as a as a crutch, maybe a little bit too often. But I tell you what, and and and. The, the rules have, have definitely changed since the beginning of, of the show. I mean, if you listen to some of those early shows um, and, and, there's, and there was absolutely nothing wrong with this, but there, there, was, there were like eight minute scenes with wit talking to a kid, <laughs> you know, which, which, uh, which I, I don't know that we could get away with that now. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of people who say, you know, I, I love those old shows and I do too. You know, I'd love those old shows and how, how wit was just, just talked to, I don't, I don't know that we can get away with that now because it's, because the, the, it's been 35 years and, and listening habits have changed and, and, and the way people take in entertainment has changed. Um, but, um, the, the way, the way I look at it is, is that I, uh, am a strong believer that if, an, if somebody in the audience figures out the lesson on their own, it makes it far more powerful than if they're told what that lesson is because it comes, it becomes a part of them. You know, when they figure it out on their own, it becomes a part of them. And so we try very hard to make sure that the story speaks for itself. Um, and, 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 and we, we will, we will come in with wit a lot of times to kind of, you know, you, you've, uh, you, you, it's, it's all set up and he's just coming to spike it over the net, you know, and then Chris, you know, on top of that, mm-hmm. because with kids, it's a little bit different. They do have to be, it, it, does, it is important to, to, to teach in, in a certain way. Um, but I, but I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say something that, that some of your audience may disagree with. Um, but, but it's the way we have done what you're saying is, is making it less preachy is that um, we have to go into, into every episode thinking I need to be entertaining first before I can, before I can be, uh, I can uh, teach a message. Um, I need to make sure that, that the story is engaging. That's the most important thing. Not that, that the message is not important. Obviously we believe it's important because it's in every, it's in every show, but we, we have, we have to make sure that, that, that the engagement happens or else they're not going to listen to it at all. You know? Um, and, and so, and, and so we, 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 we we, we try to, we, tr- we craft the story in such a way that it's, it's entertaining, that, 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 that it's dramatic or funny, or that the kids can see themselves in it, or adults can see themselves in it. This is me, you know, and then, and then, um, and, and then we can, we can, if, as long as we have a good story, then the message will come across naturally, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I, I just recently, uh, now, now that doesn't mean that we, sometimes we don't, say, okay, I've, I've got this message that I, that I, that I want to tell. And that's where, you, that, that's the catalyst for, for a show that happens often um, is that we have a, a we have a, an idea in mind. Okay. I want to, I want to tackle this theme. It was a show that I, I wrote recently. It was actually in, in the, that last album. Um, 
album 72 that you said you mm-hmm. that you just went through uh it was a show called judge me tender mm. oh that was a good one which was which was um um i i i thought you know it, in, in our in our society it feels like people are looking to be judged like they're looking at, at people around them like like you're you're judging me i walk into this room and i feel judged you know mm-hmm. and what it does is 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 that is that it takes 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 the um, the, the focus off of their sin and puts it on, well, that person is worse because they're judging me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I, I, and, and, and I and see this in society now, and I think even Christians do it. Uh, I see, it, and, and it's, and it's, it's bothersome to me because it, it, it starts this victim mentality and, and all this other stuff. And I said, I want to do, I want to do a show about that. Okay. So I've got the theme, but then I go, I say, okay, well, what is, what is the story that can encapsulate that? And if I don't come up with a good story, I will not do the story. Uh, even if I want to do that that lesson, I I, I got to come up with a with a good story. And so, and so I, I, I so this the story revolves around this this girl that 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 kind of feels like she's being judged by others. Uh, and then there's a, there's just a line right at the end where Connie says, "Why are you looking so hard for judgment?" You know, and and she ha- she has to answer that. And and that and that's really that, that that's it's just those that one line that sort of gets that theme across. Uh, but the rest of it is all is all story, and so we got to put story first. Yeah, for, for a message, message, and uh, and I, I like I said, I don't think there's a lot of people that, that wouldn't just, that wouldn't agree with that. They said, I, no, I want to get this message across, and I think that's what when, when, that, that that you have the danger of getting preachy. Yeah, at that point. And one thing is, uh, you even had said like finding those characters that are relatable because we see you know and. Uh, I'm going to go into norm, my normal co-host is actually even my pastor, but he did a couple of sermons, did a sermon in the day. And then in the evening, using peanuts characters and went into how the peanuts characters, little aspects of the peanuts personalities we can find in ourselves a little bit. Sometimes we all feel a little like Charlie Brown. Uh, sometimes uh-huh. we're also as insecure as, as Linus. And we all know somebody who's like Lucy, who's maybe a little bossy. We find something in ourselves in those characters, and that's one of the things that's been great about Adventures in Odyssey. Every time there's a new character, we find a new way to relate, or like either we have been like that character, or we know someone who has, and they remind us of somebody. They're very relatable and very yeah. real people. And so you, sometimes, you know, you listen to them, and I, I think even in, in the fan groups on Facebook, people are like sometimes you forget that they're they're not real people because you you just get get involved with the characters and so the situations they go through we completely relate and it gives us something to chew on we don't feel like you know we've been preached to we just feel like we've gotten to look at it from from a perspective of somebody and it gives us something to kind of go away and think about later uh so it's, yeah. it's one what i think the key things is those relatable characters that are having realistic situ- sometimes the situations are more comical than what we'd expect in real life but there's always that relatableness because even even one of the funniest episodes from like years past there was the snow day where rodney rathbone is chasing yeah. around some kids having a snowball fight we've all been yeah. through snow days and even uh within the last few albums there was a really great snow day where you have a, a, a buddy who's the current imaginative character yeah. And uh, there was just so much relatable of like a snow day and having that one hill you wanted to sled down, but don't go down that one because you'll end up in the river, you know. And I think most of us yeah. find a way that we, we recognize that, and then we're just able to just go along with it. And then, like like I said, you get something you kind of end up thinking about later. It's like, well, has that ever happened to me? And what did I do? What, what would I do if I was in that situation? And if I had kids, that'd be a, that'd be a question I'd ask my kids. Like, well, what would you have done? Right. Right. Well, that, I mean, with stories, relatability is the key to impact. Mm-hmm. Um, people can can see themselves in it and say, "That's me. I should make. I should follow Wit's advice." <laughs> yeah. or, or, you know, uh, that, that's how you make the most impact. And we and we get letters to that effect all mm-hmm. the time about people that say, "Wow, that was that that really hit me hard because this is where I was." Yeah. You know. And that that the judge me tender ones you were just talking. I was even telling you know Philip like, hey, you got to hear this episode. I mean, it really nails it because uh, even with the situation in there, it reminds me where some people are just looking. Everything's offensive to them. Yeah, we have so many people yeah. like that, and it's like it's, it's like they're looking to be offended. It's like you know, people are not out to get you. you know? Yeah. And then yeah. if we, if you can kind of get the mindset, realize, hey, people are not out to get you. Some people are not trying to offend you. People are not actually out. There are some people who are, you know, I'm sure. And there's people who are probably pretty judgy. But most of us are not. And, uh, you know, it's gotten now to where we can't even go and like, hey, you know what? Uh, you, you don't want to do that. You're going to regret it. 
Now it's like, oh, you're, what are you judging me? It's like, no, I'm just trying to warn you because I'm your friend and I care about you. And what you're doing is going to yep. hurt in the long run. It's like now we we can't even do that without somebody being offended and decided, oh, well, you're judging me. It's like, no, I'm just, but I am going to judge your actions. And I'm telling you, there's going to be consequences of what you're doing. And I warn you because I love you and I don't want to see right. this happen to you. Because no matter what happens, there always are consequences. Even uh, uh, that's actually something that came up in an Adventures Odyssey thing where y'all did uh, the David and Absalom story, which whoo, right. that's a tough one to, to tackle uh, because yeah. of the subject matter of where it gets to. But I love where it dealt with even though God forgives us when we do these horrible things, we can be forgiven. There's still going to be consequences because of our actions. It's going to have a result. And so it's good to be able to try to warn people like, hey, uh, I, what you're doing there is going to come back to hurt you later. And it's just nicer when people will listen when we try to warn them. Because I like it when somebody warns me. If somebody's got some more experience and sees me about to do something stupid, please come and tell me. Stop me. <laughs> yeah. That's the that's the that's the Christian response. Yeah, but we're always told we're being judgy, or as you know, Philip was actually saying yesterday, we'll be called the blockhead because they think we're stupid <laughs> <laughs> because we're trying to like, no, don't do that. So, what though? Uh, to wrap this up, what is the favorite episode that you've gotten to write? That's always well, the tough um, question. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I did this. This is uh, this has some recency bias to it. Uh, but I, I, I really, the, uh, the, the Olivia arc, uh, Olivia lo- uh, questioning her mm. faith, uh, that, that was just in this last two albums. Yeah. Um, it was really, really close to my heart because, uh, because it was something that, that, uh, I've dealt with personally, uh, well, people that I know, um, and, and, uh, and just, uh, you know, the, the, the journey that I've seen some, some kids go through, some adults go through, uh, and, and just uh, strong Christian families who have kids that have just gone wayward, you know, they get, they get to college or, or they, or whatever. And they just suddenly stop believing the things that, that they were taught. Um, and it's just, it's just sad to me. It's just sad. And, and, and it feels like it's happening more and more often, mm-hmm. but, but, uh, but, it, but yeah, in that, in that series, Olivia kind of questions her faith and, and, uh, and, and she's had got, has a lot of challenges. And um, I just, I really, I put my heart and soul into, into those episodes and I, and I hope, I hope they're impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I also, um, as you know, I, like I said, I like comedies and, um, uh, I wrote a show in like 95, something like that called hidden in my heart, which was, um, it was, it was a show with, uh, it was a parodies of star Trek and Lassie oh. and, um, yeah. and, uh, rescue, rescue, rescue nine one one. And, uh, and so that was, that, those, those, are, those are always, fun. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, yep. But that, that's definitely one of those issues. I was really glad that you tackled with the questioning faith because we have, uh, oh, and I forgot what the word, the deconstruction, uh, is what we're starting to call it now, where we see these people that they, they deconstruct their faith. And we even see even leaders within certain, you know, church groups yeah. that suddenly fall away and completely turn around. And so I, re- I appreciate that y'all, you, you were tackling that issue and, uh, and it really reminded me uh, that James Dobson even uh, has a book, uh, Holding On To Your Faith When God Doesn't Make Sense. Right. And, which I have an audio book, I think, still over on the shelf. I remember listening to it, and uh, he talks about going through uh, some rapids in Colorado, and I think it was something called the coffee pot, where he'd fallen out of the boat, and you can't see anything. I mean, you're just in the water. You can't. Air, you don't know which way is up. You're just completely lost, and you're like, well, where is God now? And uh, even someone in the fan group was just talking, you know, she was having some struggles and it, it brought some of that to mind that there are times in our lives where we don't feel like God's presence is there, but he's yeah. there. We're, we're never, we're never out of his hand. We just don't always feel as safe, but he's, he's teaching us to trust him that it's going to be okay, but we just don't know how long he's going to let us sit there and deal with it. And yeah. uh, I know I've had to be um, through some times like that myself and... Yeah, it's it's really it can be tough to hold on your faith because like why isn't this working out the way I want it to? Instead of like yeah. learning, okay, I'm learning to trust and God's got this, and I'm just gonna have to learn to go through it and become stronger on the other side. Yeah, the the lesson the lesson that I I, I tried to get across in that series was um, know what you believe and why you believe it, mm-hmm. and and get that foundation, that grounding. Okay, why, why why do I believe this? Why do I believe that God exists? 
why do I believe that God loves me? Why do I, you know, and, and, and get that grounded so that when you are, you're going to be faced with problems, you're going to be faced with, with questions, you're going to be faced with challenges that, that, that perhaps even college professors will, will throw things, throw things at you. And you're going to hit, you're going to hit that point. You know, what, what, what's the, what, what, what foundation are you, are you uh, rely, uh, relying on at that point? Um, and, and, it's, and so that, that that's, the most important thing that I, that I wanted to get across in that episode, in those episodes. And it really did deal a lot with the, uh, why do bad things still happen with an all loving God? Yeah. Why is it bad things happen? And I love the way it wrapped up where you, you got the source of it as comes really from ourselves. You know, sometimes our own guilt and shame, we, we kind of want to push God away because we feel horrible about something we feel that we've done. Uh, I was actually even just talking to Philip and that, yesterday and that's, and that's about this. Yeah, and that's Satan pushing that on us. Yeah. Satan's the one that makes us feel shame. So. There's, a, there's a great uh, Christian band called Red that has a song, um, uh, Shadow and Soul. When you kind of listen to it, it's it's like, well, this is not for God to see. I don't want God to see what I've done down in my darkness, but at the same time calling out, I'm in, my, I'm in a darkness of my own creation. Rescue me from it. But it's that, that shame of like, whoa, man, I'm down in something. I've created my own mess, but I really need God to pull me out at the same time. I just, I'm just i also afraid of having God see me in this. And what's God going to think? I know I did. I know I disobeyed. And, you know, it's that nice yeah. dichotomy thing. But I think that, that, that kind of fits in there. Sometimes we kind of run away because we know we've done something wrong. But we really, we just call out to him and he will gladly pull us out. Now, God God can use shame too, though. I, yeah. I, I, need, I, need, I, need, I need to re- uh... I need to readdress that. Uh, God can God can use shame too, and 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 guilt, uh, and those kinds of things. But it, but the difference is is that Satan, Satan then makes us not makes us turn turns it to the point where we sin again. Yeah. You know where where it's saying you're you're not worthy, so who cares? Go and do what you want. You know whatever you want to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so that was this is one of the things that yeah, I think you really addressed very well. I mean uh, with. Uh, Oh, I forgot the name of the Russian philosopher that she was reading up. That I, I, as soon as he showed up and was talking, I was like, "That's not a Russian philosopher." I knew it was like this is a demonic influence. The way he would lie oh, you, oh, you, to Olivia. You figured you figured it out from the top. Yeah, as soon as he yeah, popped I, in, and I and it, it got creepier and scarier. And I even loved the performance there by the end, where the Russian accent started fading away, as it was just going to own. You know, it, it continued to lie to her. And oh, I was, it was a, ooh, it was kind of an intense thing. And I was like, wait, somebody come breaking down the door and go and get Olivia away from this. You know, I wanted him to do like, we, we, yeah. we fans, we like to make fun of the, uh, the, um, Castles and Cauldrons episode where Wit, Wit comes in and breaks the thing. But it's like, this is a moment we need Wit to come in and be like, hey, no, <laughs> get away from her. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. I, I, it was very well representative of the influence of what, when we get into that point where Satan's like, okay, I've got you. I'm a holding you down here because I don't want you coming back because I don't you want I don't want God to use you against me. <laughs> He's, Satan's so afraid of us that he wants to keep holding us down so we're not a weapon used against him. It's really, but that, I mean, ooh, that whole thing, it was, I had tingles. I was like, oh, I know what's going on here because it, it's that, sometimes we get that little you, voice you, that lies to us. If you, if you caught it, if you caught it that early, that's pretty good because it, cause I, I was, I was giving hints I was trying to give hints along the way, mm-hmm. but I was not trying to give it away at the beginning. I was just thinking, okay, this is just, I wanted people to think that, okay, this is just Olivia's imagination running away with her, you know, because mm-hmm. she's studying this, she's studying this guy. Um, but, uh, but that, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty clever that you figured it out that quickly. Yeah. The, the one, the major giveaway is that it seemed to have its own independent thought away from her, you know, and that's yeah. why I was like, he's, 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 he was he was smarter than her. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's yeah, that's yeah. where I was like, the difference is because this is your imagination. You even when it feels you let's run away from you, you still have some control over your imagination. And it all comes from you. But that voice was like, that is not coming from her. And I was like, this is going to be a problem later. And so, oh, but it was so well written. I really did enjoy that. And that's something else I told Philip. Oh, you got to listen to this because this is right where some of the young people are are at with this deconstructionism and and the the lies that get yeah. kind of shoved in there that make people fall and oh it was good stuff it was very good stuff thank you, thank you. <laughs> well uh that's pretty much where my wrap-up was but anything you would like to add any other projects that you work on that uh maybe i'm not familiar with uh, uh apart from odyssey you mean yeah i don't know do, do you have the other projects uh, when you're not writing for odyssey 
Yeah, well, you know, uh, I I I was uh, I went freelance in uh, in 2008. I was I was with the team until 2008, and then I went freelance for about 12 years. And so I did I did a lot of faith based projects. I did some movies and uh, some books and some a uh, um, little bit of television and uh, other other audio dramas and that kind of stuff. So I've, I I I got my feet wet, but but you know what? I just um, uh, I, I missed Odyssey, and Od- Odyssey is always going to be my first love as far as uh, projects that I'm working on. Um, and, you know, I, I would be perfectly happy if this was the last job of my life. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on the show. This has been kind of fun and good introspective, good stuff. All right. Well, thanks for having me. This was fun. Right. Always love talking about Odyssey. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, Neverlanders, Marshall Younger. Well, there you have it, folks. That's this week's episode of Neverland, the Fandom Nexus. Hope you enjoy that conversation with Marshall Younger. We're going to have a lot more fun next week, even with Phil Lawler. You're going to learn a lot from Phil Lawler. He is a, he's a smart cookie, he is. So you come back next week for that. But, of course, now I do want to thank all of the people who helped us out with the introduction, including Ricky Pope of Christian Nerds Unite. I should have brought up my list. Uh, Darren Wilhite of the Wilhite and Wall Show. And then... Um, Karen, wow! I see. I should have brought up my list, so I remember who to thank. I was—I almost forgot to put the outro on this. I, I put the uh, interview that I'd already edited together with Marshall Unger and forgot completely that. Oh yeah, I have to put a quick outro out uh, set over here. Uh, Karen Kennedy, that's who it is. Karen Kennedy, who helped us out, is the lady you hear in the introduction. <laughs> so yes, now that I've completely blown my outro, I think I just better tell you to get lost. In an adventure!